So I told you this unit is going to be very integrative. So we're actually going to start by reviewing some concepts that are from um, the basics like cell biology, osmosis, but also start to bleed into an overlap with chapter 26, which is about fluid and electrolyte balance, which is a big job of the kidneys. So let's talk about what osmolarity is. Osmolarity is um, describing the number of particles in a solution and number of particles um, that can be charged particles. Typically, um, we'll, we'll see some examples. So this is going to relate to our electrolyte balance. So number of particles in solution. And we've, we've seen osmosis happening, right? Um, osmotic pressure is an important component of capillary flow across capillaries. So this is related to, if you have some chemistry, the molarity of some chemical and then the number of particles um, per molecule. This is going to give you osmolarity in osmoles per liter. So it's a unit of stuff per liter that does depend on what that stuff is, but we will be looking at, at this as like a gross measurement in terms of like isotonic. An isotonic solution for your cells, cells is 300 milliosmoles. That um, so that's the measurement, 300 milliosmoles is the concentration of all the stuff in your, surrounding your red blood cells, so of your plasma. So it's a measure of solute concentration based on what's in that solution. So isotonic means happy cells, there's, iso is the same, right? There's no net movement out and in. These are equal, we're in equilibrium. Actually, I'll write that equilibrium. So I'm gonna erase my text here so I can ask you a learning check that re relies on some previous knowledge. What happens to a red blood cell in hypotonic and hypertonic solutions? And then how does water move depending on osmolarity? Number one here, got some pictures. So if we go into hypertonic, that's, let's try. that means here's a red blood cell. We've got high, high stuff out here. Which way is water going to flow? It's going to flow out of the cell. And draw this if you need to, right? So water's going out in a hypertonic. We'll draw, add the picture. That's our hypertonic we had water exiting because we had high levels out here. High levels of stuff. Hypotonic, we're going to have a cell that is in a solution that contains like very little stuff, very few particles, solutes, etc. There is stuff inside the cell. So in the hypotonic solution, we're going to have water flow into the cell and cause it to expand. What this is telling, what, what we just said, is water is going to move from an area of low osmolarity to high osmolarity. Another way to say this is water moves from an area of high water concentration to low water concentration. This is a review of osmosis, which we've talked about before. So if you need to go back and review a little more than this, I'd recommend doing that. So we're gonna think about both fluid levels and the stuff, these particles that are in the fluid, the um, solute and the solvent. Solute is the stuff. Solvent is typically water in our cells. 
what is the stuff that's in our cells or, or outside of our cells? What is the stuff that contributes to osmolarity? There's, it could be anything, proteins, glucose, um, and those two things we will come back to. But the biggest thing that's going to contribute our osmotic gradients and that osmotic pressure, um, when we're talking about the urinary system, is going to be electrolytes. So sodium, um, potassium, what is an electrolyte? So actually, let's go there. Electrolytes are things that can dissociate into a positive and a minus, a negative thing. So they are, they dissociate into positive and negative in water. That means they're gonna have a charge in water. So HCl, um, actually dissociates into the chemical reaction into H plus and Cl minus. These are electrolytes. So which of the following of these are electrolytes? Here's your learning check too. And these are things you've all seen, right? We've talked about sodium, chloride, bicarbonate. Notice when we say sodium, often you think of it as like NaCl right? That Na and Cl dissociate to become the sodium and the chloride. Sodium chloride is this. So these three, that, that is a electrolyte. These three are electrolytes. They all have a charge to them. Glucose does not dissociate um, in water. It dissolves in water, but it doesn't have a charge then. So these electrolytes, because they, they dissociate into the positive and negative, they are going to contribute greatly to the osmotic gradient of our cells. What, what are these gradients in our cells? So what are the electrolytes that are in our cells and where are they? Um, some of the electrolytes are going to be one, you, you know these, sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium is an important one, um, not gonna include that. And calcium is the other one. We've talked about the importance of these, these um, elements, these electrolytes before with action potential, um, vesicle dependent calcium release, muscle contraction, et cetera. Establishing the negative resting membrane potential. So let's look at these concentrations in the blood plasma in the intracellular fluid. You know that sodium is high outside of the cells. So outside of the cells that include the blood plasma as well as extracellular, blood plasma is a type of extracellular fluid, right? This y-axis is concentration, milli equivalents per liter is the unit used for these, um, most of these electrolytes. So here's our sodium. It's really high outside the cell compared to inside the cell, right? And you know that already, that concentration gradient of, of sodium is established by what? Our sodium potassium pump. So since we've just reviewed that, we can probably do our potassium too, basically the opposite. So potassium, I'm doing this color, is low outside the cell and high inside the cell. Chloride is going to also be high outside of the cell. Oops, I don't actually want to do that. That is something that can cause hyperpolarization if those channels open. GABA does that. Lower inside the cell. And lastly, calcium is higher outside the cell than inside as well. So that can also rush into the cell causing vesicle dependent um, neurotransmitter release or muscle contraction when it enters in. It's not actually super high though. It's gonna be somewhat accurate here. It's lower inside the cell though. What if we add all this stuff together and look at just osmolarity? What is osmolarity inside the cell compared to outside? So I'm gonna draw a separate axis here that is just 
milliosmoles per liter. Osmolarity is going to be equivalent, right? It's got to be, or our cells are going to burst or shrivel. We want to keep our cells happy. So inside the cell and the blood plasma is going to be equal. It is about 300 milliosmoles. So this is a different y-axis here. 300 is something you will see again, because when we look at the kidney function, we're going to see that number. Urine is going to have a osmolarity to it that, we, that will vary depending on how much we need to change our plasma osmolarity in terms of regulation. So in order for an organism to maintain homeostasis, it has to maintain all these ions within this normal range, which is different inside and outside of the cell, but our specific levels, right? I have to say constant over time, constant e disequilibrium of the specific ions while continuing maintaining a constant osmolarity and, and fluid balance. So the ions themselves aren't in equilibrium, but our osmolarity and fluid across our cells are in equilibrium. Okay, so this idea of homeostasis is what our species is going to do. Um, all species need to be able to regulate water and electrolyte balance. We are taking a big view here. Um, water crosses across all cells very freely, right? So if the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid changes, so does water volume. So different um, organisms have different ways of dealing with this. You can either regulate the, which we just already said, like we do, right? So we are terrestrial, terrestrial osmoregulators just like dogs, dogs are cuter than us. So here's a picture of dogs. Um, osmo regulators. Different species have different ways of dealing with this problem of dealing with fluid and electrolyte balance. All organisms that have that osmo regulate have some way of transporting stuff across the cells. So osmoregulation is the ability to maintain homeostasis with respect to water and electrolyte balance. There are other species, so um, jellyfish, that are osmoconformers. So they do not, they conform to their external environment. Let's actually look at them quick. So here are what's called a marine osmoconformer. Compared to the external environment, what are the tissues of this jellyfish? If it's a conformer, it's going to conform to the outside environment. The outside environment is very salty, right? This is a marine organism. These tissues of these, of these organisms have the same concentration of solutes outside as inside. So that's isoosmotic. It's not necessarily the same solutes, just like with humans. Um, but we are going to have these organisms living in water and have a way of they just conform to their environment and have, let's, I think it's actually like 1200 milliosmoles in the ocean. So their cells are going to be 1200 milliosmoles inside those cells. That's very different than inside our cells, which are what? 300 milliosmoles. This is very energy efficient, but um, we don't have to be pumping things out all the time. And so they typically expend less energy pumping solutes out to, to, to regulate. Regulation takes energy. In contrast, there are marine osmo regulators. So these are in the water, right? These are most marine vertebrates, bony fish. They are going to maintain a lower blood osmolarity than the, the ocean. So the ocean water is still about 1,200. These guys um, are going to be less than that. Let's say, I don't, I don't actually know, 300 to 500, I'm kind of guessing there, milliosmoles. 
They maintain a low blood osmolarity by drinking water and pumping out electrolytes. Does that make sense? That's what they need to do. Take in water, pump out extra electrolytes so that they don't have high osmolarity inside their cells. This requires energy. So they're going to, and they're going to excrete a concentrated urine. This is similar to what we do as terrestrial osmoregulators. So the last picture of non-humans here is, um, did I do this already? So compared to the environment, these tissues are what? Hypoosmotic. Hypo, hyper, got to iso, got to know those. Lower is hypoosmotic. Okay, last picture of non-humans, the cutest ones. Terrestrial osmoregulators, just like humans are these adorable golden retrievers. There is water loss due to evaporation and thermoregulation, panting in dogs, sweating in humans. That's thermoregulation, constant water loss through, through that, metabolism. So we have to drink water constantly, um, not constantly, but we have to take in water through food and drink. Here, I'll do a water drop. And then we have to retain electrolytes. We're not getting electrolytes um, from the water. We don't swim in water. So we're taking in electrolytes along with our food and, and liquids. That means we have to produce a urine that is variable in its osmolarity. So urine is going to contain variable amounts of water electrolytes and wastes. And we want to be able to regulate our urine production to be very, very yellow and concentrated potentially to very, very large amounts of urine and very dilute if necessary, depending on our environmental conditions. Let's see. So in order to do this, this is what this looks like in terms of regulation of water input and output. Input, point here is mostly it's drinking, some food too, so ingestion, right? Most of what we take in in the body is gonna be through deliberate, although sometimes it's our hypothalamus telling us we're thirsty, right? We get, um, we're taking that in. Output of water, there is, like I said, some sweat, um, metabolism that's going to result in water loss, but urine is 60% of our water loss. The osmolarity of urine can be can vary between 100 and 1200 milliosmoles. So we can regulate output and that's a useful thing. We want to be able to regulate this depending on what our input is, depending on what our sweat loss is, um, how much we do have, there's also volume. So volume and osmolarity of urine can be regulated. Let me tell you one story. There was once a person who did a Great Uintas Pea Race. This is a competition where you drink as much water as you can. The, really the goal is to pee as many times as you can in 24 hours number of peas in 24 hours. There's been other cases of this actually resulting in death. Luckily, this person, Dr. Robin, did not die, um, not close, but she did drink a lot of water and peed a lot. What's gonna happen? You're gonna actually flush out your electrolytes. Your body cannot, um, you're going beyond what your body can maintain homeostatically. This is called hyponatremia. I will come back to this when we are ready to look at it even more in detail. Hyponatremia, this is low sodium in the, in the blood. So typically it's defined as less than um, 135. We don't, we don't really care. I don't know if you remember from the when I showed you those concentrations, normal is about 145. I don't really care about these numbers. This is milliequivalent per liter. It's low, 
That's the point. And that's because when you're peeing, you're peeing out electrolytes. You can only pee out so little in every urination. So you are losing electrolytes, flushing them out. Um, so we'll come back to this. 